under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Ahmed bin Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Chairman of the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Foundation. The Dubai Department of Tourism and Commerce Marketing organized the 13th Ramadan Forum. The event took place at the Dubai World Trade Center, Zabil Hall, between the 5th and 16th Ramadan, 1435, which coincided with July 3rd through 14th, 2014. The forum included events, lectures, and religious seminars given by prominent preachers from the Islamic world. The lectures were given in six different languages: Arabic, English, Urdu, Malayalam, Bengali, and Tagalog. The forum gave its audience a chance to improve their hearts and souls and increase their faith during Ramadan, the month of giving and worship. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I introduce you today's speaker, we'd like to bring to your attention that any questions should be sent via SMS to the following number: zero five five double nine five zero one hundred zero five five double nine five zero one hundred. Some of you know the speaker very well, Brother Wajdi Akari, also affectionately known as Abu Musab. He was born in Lebanon and currently is based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. When he turned 18, he moved to the United States as a student, and he met a change in his life from a deviated lifestyle of a college student that had led him to join a Buddhist group and a rap group while in the U.S. It was during one Ramadan when it was a time for reviving his soul and experiencing real iman for the first time in his life. His life started to change slowly. And he eventually met a brother studying at Al Madina Islamic University in KSA, thereby, by the will of Allah, directing him to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the brother would spend much time with Abu Musab, educating him in the correct way and practices of Islam. Brother Abu Musab, Wajdi Akari, he then went on to get a Bachelor of Arts. In Islamic studies with honors, and he pres presently holds weekly classes in Tafsir, Aqidah, Dawa, and Arabic, along with delivering Friday sermons in Arabic and English. And he has been granted permission to give many lectures and sermons within the many hospitals in Jeddah. And with no further ado, I'd like to invite Brother Wajdi Akari to the stage. <laughs> إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهديه الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا هادي له. All praise due to Allah. We praise Him abundantly, and we seek refuge with Allah with the evil from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds. Verily, whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah allows to go astray, because they do not want any guidance, and no one can guide. And I bear witness, as you bear witness, that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, the Exalted and Mighty, the Majestic. He is alone, having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mansion. We ask Allah to grant him peace, and we ask Allah to send his blessings and salutations upon him. Upon his wives, his companions, and each and every one who follows them on their path of righteousness, until the day of recompense. As to what follows, in this worldly life of ours, the glamour and the attractions and the temptations are too many to enumerate. In fact, if we were to sit here and discuss what could distract us from the priorities, then we would need a few years. To go over them, just enumerating them without elaboration. Everything out there seems to be there specifically to divert us from the direction which we are meant to be going in. And tonight is not an exception to the rule. Without any further elaboration, you understand what I'm saying. Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. So what happens is all of these things that are going on makes it difficult to focus. And 
the intelligent one is the one who's able to refocus, to zoom in at that object, and then from there begin the journey all over again. And Ramadan has always been and will always be for this ummah a time of revival, a time of success, a time of uh, progress, a time of prosperity. And inshallah we hope that this Ramadan was, will be no different than the previous ones or the coming ones. Even though the ummah will be going through difficulties as we all know today. This however is for the ultimate success of the ummah. We grieve and we feel pain. However, this is what the Sahaba had to go through. There were tough times and rough times before they were granted success and superiority over the rest of the world. And because we have gone far from what they were upon, we have to go through a similar process before we are brought back to the position they were in. It's a normal situation. So what is it that we should be focusing on? I think the title of the lecture explains it. The permanent abode. Jannah. Jannah is our home. True or false? Have you ever been, can you call your home a home if you've never entered there? Sure. Jannah is an exception to the rule. Home is where, where you were probably born, where you were raised, and a place that you frequently enter. But you can never call home a place that you've never been to. So how is it that we consider Jannah our home? And when I ask the question, almost everyone seems to agree that it is our home, but you've never been to this home of yours. That is because of the situation of our father Adam, alayhi salam. And we as his children follow him in this regard. He was once a person who inhabited paradise. And Allah decreed that something happens which made him be expelled along with his wife Hawa from paradise. But that remained our home. And we're only trying to gain back entry. Now in this very moment, the ultimate objective is to re-enter our home. This is why you fast. This is why I fast. This is why you pray and I pray. This is why every single act of worship, every time we remember Allah, ultimately, it is to enter Jannah. There is no bigger goal, no bigger objective to achieve or attain. But ironically and amazingly, we forget. We know, but we forget. How often do we think of Jannah when we do any type of ibadah or on daily basis or on weekly basis or even on monthly basis? Some will say, wow, it's been a long time. I mean, yes, in my dua, I ask Allah for Jannah, but it's just to, it's words I say. I haven't really grasped what Jannah is. And the objective of this lecture is to highlight first the priorities, which is where we're supposed to be uh, focusing. Secondly, what is Jannah? What does it entail? What is awaiting the believers? Is it something similar to what we see in our daily lives? You go out to the beauty, you see you know, trees and greenery and waterfalls and so on and so forth. Is it like that or is it better or is it worse? For some, among the Muslims, they don't really believe that Jannah exists. As, an, as a materialistic location. They believe Jannah is just a, a symbolic idea for bliss and happiness, which is very much not in agreement with the Quran and the Sunnah, as we will explain in the lecture, inshallah. So the true success is that Jannah, based on the fact that Allah says, Kullu nafsin Subhanallah. Allah Azza wa Jal told us each soul shall taste death. No exception to the rule. No matter who that person is, how important that person is, how many bodyguards that person has, when the angel of death comes, he does not need any permits, permissions or anything. 
He just takes the soul by the permission of Allah, by the command of Allah. So every soul shall taste death. When will you be paid your full wages? In this dunya, some do. But very often, not. Because you may do a lot of good and face a lot of calamities. You do good, but Allah tests you. Did you get paid for your wages? Not yet. Meaning Allah has saved that for the believer for Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That's why the ayah says, إِنَّمَا تُوَفَوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ You will be paid your wages in full only on the day of resurrection. And the conclusion of that is, whosoever then is moved away from the fire, زُحْزِحَ It's like you're shifting something and kind of pushing it away. Whoever has been shifted and moved away from the hellfire, وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ And he was admitted to paradise, فَقَدْ فَازْ Then, that person has already attained success. And if you pay attention to the grammar, the fact that Allah used the past tense, faz. This ha something already happened, it's a done deal. He's already attained success. The moment that person is moved from the fire, admitted to paradise. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ And this worldly life is nothing but false deception. So Allah Azza wa Jal simplified for us what we may spend hours contemplating on. The whole thing boils down to is being moved away from the fire, admitted to paradise. That's why we do every single act of worship. But then again, the question is, is it worth it? Sometimes you anticipate something for so long, but then you get disappointed. Does it happen? Does it happen that you wait for something for so long and then when it finally comes, you're disappointed. You may order something online. Some item that appears to be very nice online. And then you ship it from overseas. And it takes, you know, two to three weeks for the shipping. Of course, you choose the cheaper one so that you don't have to pay express and so on and so forth. When it finally arrives and there's that moment of excitement and you open the box and it's like, really? This is what I paid, you know, I don't know how much money for. This, it's a lousy item. It's a broken item. So you can anticipate something for so long and then be disappointed. Is that possible with Jannah? Can, can we anticipate Jannah for so long and then when people walk in, it's like, that's it? This is why I left all the haram for? This is why I did all this ibadat, you know, praying behind the imam, reading one juz in every two rak'at in, in Ramadan or in, the, in every night, I'm sorry, reading one juz. This is what it was for? It's impossible. It is impossible that any human being will feel any uh, disappointment, displeasure, or dissatisfaction in Jannah. Why? This is what the lecture will explain. First, we should know the names of Jannah. It has been called Darul Khuld. It's been called Jannatun Naim. The Firdaus is also a name of Jannah and is the highest part of Jannah. Darul Muqam. We have many names that occur in the Quran and the Sunnah that describe paradise. Of course, the translations may vary, but they have to do with permanence and they have to do with gardens. Gardens. We love gardens in our very nature. So first, let us describe, or we'll try to take it step by step. Not really possible uh, in a very detailed manner, but in a rough way. Let us assume that this dunya has come to an end, and it is Yawm Al-Qiyamah, right? And of course, we have many ayat and ahadith which describe Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But we want to avoid discussing Jahannam now, in order to keep the mood uh, happy for Jannah. But we cannot forget that Jahannam exists and that Allah Azza wa Jal has prepared it for kathiran min al-nas, min al-jinni wal-ins. Allah has prepared the hellfire. Why? Human beings, as Allah said, is لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُود Human beings are ungrateful to Allah. I mean, look at all the blessings which we have. Our gratefulness to Allah is barely there. And this is among the Muslims, the believers. Amongst others, it is non-existent. In fact, some may acquire from Allah all the blessings and then utilize them for disobeying Allah or for worshipping others with Allah or without worshipping Allah at all. So human beings are ungrateful and there's a 
there's a punishment for that. But for those who are grateful, it is Jannah. So what happened on Yawm Al-Qiyamah after the Sirat? The Sirat, which is the, the actual path that will be placed on top of Jahannam, right? This is other than the Sirat Al-Mustaqim, the one where it's actual Ibadah, the, the actual way of Islam. This is a physical Sirat that will be cast on Jahannam and then the believers will pass over Jahannam. Some will be caught in that and some will get part of the fire until they make it to the other side. And Allah showed us or described that in the Quran, وَسِيكَ الَّذِينَ تَقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا Then those who have feared their Lord in this worldly life will be gathered together in groups to Jannah. Until when they arrive there, the doors or the gates will be open. The gates of Jannah will be open. Now, I tend to refer only to authentic ahadith. Meaning, inshallah, whatever you hear in this lecture is based on a hadith that have been verified and authenticated, but perfection belongs to Allah. Uh, I did not refer to any weak narrations unless I did so by mistake. So some, some information I will share with you, I won't necessarily give you the reference, because if we were to do so, then we will never finish really. I will only refer to it, but it's based on what has been authentically attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One hadith explains that between the two gates of Jannah, okay, you know, you enter a location right now, we have gates or doors. Do you know the actual distance between the two gates of Jannah? Does anyone happen to know? Anyone knows? 40 years. How long would it take you to go to walk 40 years, if you took 40 years walking from one location, I don't know how many times you'll go around the earth. I haven't tried it. I don't know if you have. Uh, Mr. Fitness, mashallah, tabarakallah. But that's a quite a long time. This is the actual distance between the two gates of Jannah. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Verily they shall come one day where it will be packed with people. It will be crowded. There will be so many human beings from among the believers, from the followers of the Prophet Muhammad and the previous prophets and messengers, that it will be completely crowded. Now our Prophet Muhammad has been given certain privileges, such as being the first one to knock on the door uh, or the gates of Jannah. He said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, أَنَا أَكْثَرُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ تَبَعًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَأَنَا أَوَّلُ مَنْ يَقْرَعُ بَابَ الْجَنَّةِ he وسلم, said, I will be the one with the most followers among the prophets on the day of resurrection. And I will be the first person to knock on the gates of paradise. So the, the prophet وسلم, will be given that shafa'a, one of the shafa'at or the intercessions of the prophet وسلم, is that one. Where he will be the first one to knock and therefore the gates of Jannah will open. And then the first batch of believers will enter. The first batch of believers were described, they will enter, their faces will be glittering like the full moon. And the second batch, their faces will be glittering like the stars, that the shining stars in the sky. So we know from other hadith that when the people enter paradise, they will be the size of who? Your size right now? You know, we've shrunk over the passage of time. Our father Adam was... Very tall, right? 70 feet according to some of the narrations. So everyone who will be admitted to paradise will go back to that huge size. Don't worry, you won't be sitting in the same car so you don't have to worry about how you will fit, right? Everything will be uh, modified accordingly. Jannah is modified accordingly because we see everything will be spacious and vast. Furthermore, each one will have the beauty of Yusuf salam. And we know that Yusuf salam was given the beauty of half of the world. So it doesn't matter how we look now, right? If sometimes one of us looks in the mirror and he's like, mm, Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal, don't worry about it. Once one of us, we ask Allah to admit us all to paradise. Once a person enters paradise, he's automatically handsome. And there's no need for any, you know, gel or any kind of stuff that, you know, people do to, to, to them, themselves today so they can beautify themselves. No need for none of that stuff. It will be all natural. And they, they will enter Jannah with their faces glowing. Now, we can refer to many um, suwar 
uh, many chapters, if we may use the term chapters from the Quran, that describe Jannah. But one particular surah that reminds us of Jannah, it gives us like a description of Jannah and then a reminder from Allah is Surah Ar-Rahman. Right? So we hear, فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ So which of the favors of your Lord do you, meaning both jinn and ins, do you deny? And of course, when the jinn heard this, they replied to Allah Jalla Jalalu saying, we don't deny any of these favors of Allah Azza wa Jal. For example, it says uh, in Surah Al-Rahman, Ayah 46, but for such as fear the time when they will stand before their Lord, there will be two gardens. So anyone who fears standing before Allah, what does that mean? What type of fear is it? Is it the type of fear that you have from a lion? Like right now, if there's a lion and you're afraid of the lion, what do you do? Do you have a discussion with the lion? Say, listen, um, I'm a nice guy. You're a nice lion. Why don't we work this out, you know, and just let me leave without any problems? Absolutely not. The fear one has from a lion is not one where he negotiates or he's afraid of the lion that he has to explain to the lion why he came to the cage by mistake. It's the type of fear where you just have to run for your life. Period. You have to escape. That, that is not the type of fear that we are referring to. This is the fear which requires one of us to act a certain way in this worldly life so that we don't have to have the wrong answers on Yawm Al-Qiyamah when you are questioned by Allah Azza wa Jal. That's the type of fear. It's the type of fear that will make us behave a certain way. Otherwise, it's meaningless. It is not fearing Allah in the sense, it is fearing standing before Allah, therefore a preparation has to be made. Then which of the favors of your Lord do you all deny? Allah then says, containing all kinds of trees in the light. There are so two gardens in Jannah, which contains all types of trees and delights. There will be two springs which will be flowing, and they will have fruits in all of them, and these fruits will be very near. They will be very near, along with carpets and linings with rich brocade. And the fruits of gardens will be near and easy to reach. In them there will be maidens. Now, I don't know, I don't see any sisters here, which is, I don't know if, if something's wrong here or something, or maybe the sisters are somewhere else. Okay. See, because this is a very sensitive issue. Uh, when we discuss Hur al Ain, uh, as a speaker, you have to be very careful if sisters are somewhere in the crowd, whether they are visible or invisible. Why? Because women are jealous. And once you start speaking about Hur al Ain, Hur al Ain, she starts thinking, hey, what does this guy want from my husband? Okay? He's mine now. Please don't discuss Hur al Ain who have such and such qualities and such and such attributes. So it creates a defensiveness among the sisters. Therefore, I will not elaborate much on Hur al Ain. Sorry, brothers. But you can read them in the Quran and the Sunnah and have fun on your own. However, we will explain the position of Islam because the, the very first objection among the sisters is wait a second. So, you know, you're saying that there's Hur al Ain for the men. What about the women? Are they Hur al Ain too? Well, that name wouldn't sound right, right? Because Hur al Ain is female. So, what do the women get in Jannah? if men will get women in Jannah? Well, there are two explanations from among the scholars, two opinions of the scholars. The first one is that Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about this issue based on facts. The first fact is, now, are you allowed to have more than one wife? Again, not the best topic to discuss. Yes. Can a sister have more than one husband? No. So by default, right now, men are polygynous or polygamous depending on which term you like to use whereas women are not therefore Allah spoke to us according to what is already normal and standard and that is that you as a man could have more than one woman not the case with the women secondly women are ten, tend to be shy and modest because this is something that is abnormal now it is also expected for them to be considered abnormal even though Allah might allow it in the life to come. So you don't hear a sister telling the other one, I can't wait to go to Jannah so I can have four husbands. It just doesn't sound right. Not for the men, not for the women as well. So based on the nature of women, the Quran did not speak about that. But Allah said, لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُونَ Everyone will get whatever everyone wants. So it doesn't have to tell the sisters you will have more than one man. 
it doesn't have to be mentioned because this is something that is against their shyness and modesty. But the ayah, generally speaking, saying everyone will get whatever everyone wants. And you can understand that. Or the second explanation is, this is what you think now. But this is not what you will think then. Meaning what we want now is based on our human nature and human needs and limitations. But everyone who will be admitted to paradise will be recycled. In a sense that the same needs and demands will no longer exist. Therefore a sister might say now, well I want to have more than one man in Jannah. But once you enter Jannah, she will be happy with whatever Allah Azza wa Jal gives, whether that includes more than one man or it does not. Why? No one will ever be dissatisfied in Jannah. So we don't have to worry about that. Then the end, Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَهَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ So what would be an appropriate recompense for excellence? Excellence. But the excellence of the human being is so limited and the excellence of Allah is so perfect. Meaning what we consider to be ihsan is nothing in the sight of Allah. We might worship Allah as if we can see Him and if we don't reach that level that we know that Allah sees us. But that is nothing to Allah But the ihsan which comes from Allah is something that we human beings cannot even count or enumerate. Right? وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you were to strive to count the favors of Allah, we will not be able to do so. So then Jannah uh, will have gardens and fruits and rivers and so on and so forth. طيب. Will there be um, rivers in Jannah? Sure. What types of rivers? And is it the type of river that you like just watch? Does it flow above you? Does it flow under you? Does it flow by you? The ayat says, تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ that these rivers will be flowing underneath these gardens. Now Allah Azza wa says, فِيهَا أَنْهَارٌ مِنْ مَاءٍ غَيْرِ آسٍ That there will be uh, uh, rivers that have water that cannot go bad. None of them have an expiration date. The same applies for the milk which will be there. And the khamr. Khamr that will not give you a headache. A khamr that will not taste foul. People that get intoxicated today, they don't necessarily enjoy the taste of the intoxicants. Many of these shots that they take actually taste very bad. You see them close their eyes and just take them. But they, they are doing it because they're trying to run away from their problems. They're not happy with this world for whatever reason. How do you escape? You get drunk. So they don't necessarily enjoy it. Furthermore, it makes the brain covered. It makes a person say things that they don't want to say, do things they don't want to do. Someone may actually kill a family member, kill a stranger, do all kinds of strange things. The wine which is in Jannah is very much unlike that. It's exactly the opposite. It doesn't give a headache, it doesn't taste foul, and it doesn't make a person become uh, intoxicated so that they do not know what they are saying. There will be all types of fruits in Jannah. And the Quran mentions some, it mentions rumman, and it mentions other fruits as well. But then you say, I've, I've eaten, in fact, I don't like rumman, right? The prom grenade. I don't even like it. You may say that. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu an Abi, taught us something that is very important. He said, the only commonality between what we hear, or what we read today, or what we hear about the words, and that in Jannah, the only thing in common is the actual word. So you say Rumman, and you say Rumman in Jannah. The only thing that is common between them is the word Rumman. As for the essence, there's absolutely no comparison between the two. So when we describe Jannah, we don't want to limit it to our own intellect. Why? Because Allah already told us in the Hadith Qudsi that He has prepared for the righteous slaves, مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رأت Allah has prepared for the righteous slaves what no eye has ever seen. What have you seen in this life of yours? You're 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. What have you seen? A lot. Even if you're 15 years old, you've seen a lot. Every day you see thousands and millions of images. What is in Jannah, you've never seen. And you might have seen some things that, that you know, made your heart skip. Your heartbeat skipped of how beautiful it is, a, a waterfall or something of this nature. Yet, what is in Jannah, you've never seen. 
ولا أذن سمعت and no ear has ever heard today people like to enjoy all types of sounds whether they are halal or haram now we have halal sounds and haram sounds what is in Jannah no ear has ever heard and it is all halal ولا خطر على قلب بشر and that is the most amazing thing and it's something which has never come across a human's mind meaning if you were to spend you, the rest of your life from this moment until you die imagining Jannah okay you say okay I'm gonna quit my job divorce my wife sorry sisters abandon my kids and I'm gonna just uh, buy a tent and install it on the top of the mountain and sit there and just try to imagine Jannah until I die don't do this by the way huh someone will take this part of the lecture say this is the new recommendation no 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 but if someone were to do this and you spend the next 30 years trying to imagine Jannah, you will not even be able to imagine it properly for a split second. Why? What is in Jannah? Allah has not allowed any human being to even imagine. So it is beyond what we can describe. So don't be tricked by the words. Or when you say fruits, you say, oh fruits, I just had some fruits. In fact, there are fruits in front of me on the table. So what is the difference between the fruit now and the fruit in Jannah? Big difference. Big difference. An important element of Jannah is that there will be no hard feelings. Allah Azza wa Jal described the people in Jannah that they will be ikhwan ala sururin mutaqabilin. Everybody will be uh, in, in good, on good terms with his brethren and they'll be sitting on sofas reclining facing each other. Today, Amongst the believers in general, there's all kinds of enmity, hatred, envy, all types of stuff which actually ruin our brotherhood, affect our brotherhood and make the ummah, you know, uh, stay away from unity which is something that we need quite a lot to, uh, you know, move on to move on towards the promises that Allah has promised his ummah towards the end of time In Jannah, you will have zero issues with no one no matter who it is, everyone will be happy with everyone else. You will eat a lot. In some of the narrations it says, if you were just to imagine only as soon as the idea of food comes to mind, this food will present, be presented before you. Huh? dan, And everything will be near. It's not like you're sitting on a sofa and then you, you, know, you feel like having a chicken. You have to get up, go to the kitchen, get a pot, you know, find a chicken running around somewhere in Jannah and grab it by the neck and say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and slaughter the chicken. You don't have to do any of that. You want chicken and chicken will be there. And you'll be enjoying the chicken. Tayyip, nowadays, mashallah, and some people show you how well they perform during iftar. You see the brothers, mashallah, with a plate bigger than his face. You know, he's walking around like this. All you see is a plate. And the brother's hiding behind it, right? With rice and chicken, and beef and everything on to say, Akhi, is this for the family or for... Say, no, no, this is the first plate, Akhi. Inshallah, I will go and refill as soon as I finish this one. Of course, half of it ends up in the trash, which is so un-Islamic to be wasting all this food. But that's another discussion now. Uh, in Jannah, what if you eat a lot? Mm, bathroom? Huh? Would you like, every time you eat, you spend, you know, half of your time in Jannah going to the bathroom? Absolutely not. The Prophet ﷺ said that when you eat, all that will happen is that you will sweat. Perspiration will be how you will digest your food and then that smell will be that of musk. Yani you eat more, you don't have to worry about weight, you don't have to go on a diet, you don't have to watch, you know, weigh yourself every other day, see whether you're gaining weight or losing weight, none of that stuff. You'll be constantly fit, in excellent condition and shape, with all the blessings that Allah gave you around, right? Of course, the hadith mentions that your home will be like a pearl. It'll be a tent which looks like a pearl. And the distance is that of 60 years. And you will have family all over the place that don't see each other. So now you speak about real estate, huh? You want to invest and buy a small land and then you want to build a house on it and then sell it so you can have a bigger land. People like to do real estate. That's one way to make money. The, the, the last person, the last person to enter Jannah, his real estate in Jannah, his property minimum, minimum, is a tent that looks like a pearl, the distance of which is 60 years. 
with your family members, as in, you know what, all over the place, but they don't even see each other because it is so spacious. Subhanallah. Can you imagine? Of course you cannot imagine. I just told you earlier, you cannot imagine. But we can try. We can at least visualize somehow what it will be like. And it sounds too good to be true, but it is true. It is not too good to be true. It is true. It is the revelation of Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you go through this museum or uh, the exhibition, right? Not a museum. You see the miracles of the Quran, right? You see the scientific miracles of the Quran. This all reaffirms our Iman. I mean, we're already believers. But as, as Ibrahim said, qalbi. Anytime you get something that will, will rejuvenate your faith, it will increase your faith, it will reboost your faith, you want it. Each one of us is in need of something that will reaffirm his belief in Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these are the things which we were promised by Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah said, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ So then, we have removed all kinds of hatred and enmity which have, they have in Jannah. Type. Will you die in Jannah? Will people be going to Janazah? You know, a bunch of people in Jannah gathering, where are you going? Janazah, Fulan, he passed away. Can someone pass away in Jannah? No. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever enters there, there will be a caller. After people enter Jannah, there will be a caller who will call out and say, may you live forever and never perish. So the inhabitants of Jannah will remain there, remain there eternally. And this word eternity, we've never experienced in life. Have you ever experienced anything that is eternal, permanent? Nope. Everything we have goes away. Family members go away. Money goes away. Huh? As soon as you get your salary, the next day you're waiting for the next month's salary. Huh? It goes away. The people that you love often travel and leave you behind. They go away. Your neighbors go away. Your job sometimes goes away depending on how well you perform or otherwise. Everything we have come across in this life happens to go away. Subhanallah. There's nothing permanent. The only permanent thing in the ultimate sense is your soul in Jannah. That, it will never change. No one will come and say, okay, khalas, you've had nice 30 years in Jannah, and now it's time to leave. Huh? Your stay has come to an end. Never will that happen. And this gives us a peace of mind. Yani, if you live 50 years, and we worship Allah in the poor manner in which we worship Allah Azza wa Jal. And then He gives you Jannah forever. How is that as an award or a reward for our action? It's like you get a job in a company, like a big corporate company, and you work there for like two months, right? And you do a poor job and they say, listen, we're going to give you share in this company. In fact, this company now belongs to you. You will forever make money as long as this company makes money and you're just a poor employee. It, this doesn't happen. But it, the reward of Allah Azza wa Jal for the believers is of such. Why? Because Allah is Jawadun Kareem subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the most generous. The most generous. We are miserly. No matter how generous you are, at the end of the day, human nature is miserliness. Ah, maybe I can keep it for a little longer. Well, I want to give him this, I give him half. Huh? You have a sandwich? You want to give a whole sandwich? Let me give him half a sandwich. This is the way we are. Maybe you're more generous. You give two sandwiches. Barakallah feek. I'm not saying anything. But no matter how generous we are, no one can be compared unto Allah Azza wa Jal. Laysa There's nothing like Allah. Not in His essence, nor in His attributes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous. Another aspect of Jannah is clothing. Huh? Today, a lot of money is spent on clothes. For some, a lot more than others. But no matter what, at the end of the day, clothing is a representation of ourselves. And we know we have the best example of the Prophet ﷺ, who always appeared nice, who always smelled nice, who always looked nice. And that is a forgotten sunnah. For some, the opposite has become the sunnah. Looking like they don't know where they're coming from or where they came from or where they're going. That's not from the sunnah. The sunnah entails that you try to according to the blessings of Allah. Now if someone does not have enough uh, wealth to dress a certain way, no one's going to say anything. But for those who can afford it, I'm not going to give you a lecture on it now. You are supposed to 
look, smell, and appear nice. As per the blessings of Allah. Why? Allah likes to see the uh, materialization of His favors upon you. Gives you a lot of money, and then you look like you don't have anything. So the clothing is an aspect of our lives. The clothing of Jannah is what we are not allowed to wear today. You as men, what is it that you cannot wear today? Besides a dress and a skirt. Silk, right? Silk cannot be worn by men in this worldly life. Because that will be the dress or the fabric of the life to come. And silk is by its nature fancy. As soon as you put on silk, you automatically shift to a, a, a royal state. Uh, this is the way it is. And this is why, you know, silk is always associated with wealth and, and richness and so on and so forth. But that will be the dress code of the people of Jannah. Of different colors, of course, the Quran and the Sunnah explain. Now, you have a shirt. Who, who amongst you had a favorite shirt when he was a kid? Like a shirt that you loved so much that your mother always told you, stop wearing a shirt. And then, you know, you just kept wearing a shirt because you weren't an obedient child. We all had this one shirt or one pants or whatever it is that we liked so much. And where is it now? Gone. Did any one of you keep it and hangs it on the wall in the house? Right? When people enter your house, say, MashaAllah, what is this tiny shirt? Wallahi, akhi, when I was 40 years old, this was my favorite shirt. I like to keep it. So I hung it on my wall. No one ever does that. And if you do meet someone like this, let me know where he is. I would like to visit him. But the bottom line is, we just, no matter how much you liked it, khalas, it's gone. Because clothes wear out. You buy it, it looks beautiful. You wash it once, depending on how successful your spouse is, and you're like, um, is this the same shirt I bought last week? It was blue. Now it's green, right? With a hole in it. And bleach over there and all kinds of, hey, what happened to my shirt? You wash it a second time, it's a completely new shirt. Third time, it shrinks. And then you wear it a few times and khalas, it looks like it's 20 years old. Because our clothing wear out. The clothing of Jannah will never wear out. They will not become old. They will not become discolored. Nothing of this sort will happen to them. So the clothing are also permanent. Um, will that come to an end? Absolutely not. Because Allah Azza wa Jal says, Inna hadha larizqana, aw larizquna ma lahu min nafad. This is our provision, which will have an absolutely, there's no way it will have an end. It is permanent in the ultimate sense. Now, you go to Jumu'ah. Today is Sunday. Right. You've gone to Jumu'ah a couple of days ago. And when you speak about Jumu'ah, you have two types of people. Those who go early, or let's say three types of people. Those who go early, those who go right when the Imam is about to finish, and those who don't wake up. I hope you're not the third type, at least. As for the first two, I have some news for you. An authentic hadith from the Prophet ﷺ tells us that there are special scribes, angels, who write down the names of people who attend Jumu'ah. They'll be standing at the doors of the masjid, writing down the names of the people. Of course, the one who goes the earliest is like the one who offered a camel and then a cow and so on and so forth. The hadith explains the equivalence of your uh, early attendance to an amount of sadaqah or uh, uh, for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, a sacrificial animal for the sake of Allah until someone offers an egg from a chicken. But once the Imam gets on the member and he says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, the malaika close the books and they no longer write the names of those who attend. So if you have made it to Jumu'ah, past that Salam of the Imam, you actually did not get any reward for Jumu'ah. However, you don't have to pray Dhuhr for Rak'at because you still caught the Salah with the Imam or the Khutbah with the Imam. But the Ajr of Jumu'ah is associated with your making it to the Masjid prior to the Salam of the Imam. Authentic Hadith. I'm not bringing this from my own mind. I see some face like, what? I never knew this. Well, that's the benefit of the lectures. We know things that we are either reminded of things which we know or we are given information which we didn't know existed. And obviously then if we didn't make it on time, it's gone. But what about the first group, which is the best group, those who go early. Those who go early in the dunya, of course they get a lot of ajr. 
You enter the masjid, you give tahiyyat to the masjid, then you're sitting down remembering Allah and you're reading Quran and all the good stuff. And the whole time you're waiting for the salah, the malaika is writing down for you, أَنَّكَ فِي صَلَاةِ مَا دُمْتَ تَنْتَظِرِ الصَّلَاةِ You'll be given the ajr of praying as long as you are waiting for the prayer. That's a benefit and a blessing from Allah. But what would that give us on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? The hadith of As-Suq. In Jannah, there will be a marketplace. And that marketplace is not like the marketplace in the dunya. Now you go to the marketplace, you'll see good stuff and bad stuff, a lot of fitna. In Jannah, there's a special marketplace that when you leave your spouses behind and you go to this market, which is on day of the Jumu'ah. And now, the closer you are to the Imam in this worldly life, the closer you'll be to Allah Jalla Jalalahu on Yawm Al-Qiyamah in that souk. When you go there, a special wind will blow from the north and it will touch the faces and the bodies of the people. And every time you go, you will be increased in beauty. You're already handsome like Yusuf alayhi salam. Every Jumu'ah you'll become even more handsome. So much so that the hadith says when you return back home to your spouses, they will say to you, you have become more beautiful. And then to, and they will also in turn become more beautiful. Then the person will say to their spouses, and you have also become more beautiful. So there's a special souk in Jannah for those who used to frequent the masajid in this worldly life and used to go to Jumu'ah early. So a reminder for me and for you to try to push ourselves a little bit and try to go er early on Jumu'ah as much as we can. Alhamdulillah, there's plenty of time between Fajr and Dhuhr. There's no need to sleep until the last half an hour, then quickly jump into the shower and do a half shower, really. And no ghusul and go out wearing half of the clothes. And people just come, you know, sleeping during the Jumu'ah. No need for all of that. A special preparation has to be made so that we may go early in this worldly life and therefore be among the, those who are closest to Allah Azza wa Jal on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Tayyib. This is all nice. But not good enough. What is the best thing in Jannah? Who knows? Now, the best thing in Jannah is something that requires a lecture of its own. And I don't think my time allows me to give a new lecture. But I will briefly share some of the narrations or a combination of the narrations which speak about that particular blessing on Yawm Al Qiyamah. Um, I have a few note cards. I'm going to choose one of the brief ones to be brief. Right there. So this one here, once the people enter paradise, a caller will say, Oh, people of paradise, you have an appointment with Allah in which he wishes to reward you. So they will say, and what is that reward? Has he not already made our faces bright? Made our scales heavy? Entered us into paradise and pushed us away from the fire. Remember the ayah? فَمَنْ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَاسِ And when they are like that, all of a sudden, light shines, uh, a light shines that encompasses all of paradise. So they raise their heads and behold, the compeller exalted is he, and holy are his names, has come to them from above them, and, ma and uh, majestified them and said, O people of paradise, Peace be upon you, right? Tahiyatum fiha, salam. So Allah Azza wa Jal will give salam to the people of Jannah. So they will say, Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam. You don't, you don't return a salam to Allah Azza wa Jal because one of the names of Allah is as salam. Allah is the one who grants peace and security. And you are the possessor of that. Allah Azza wa Jal will then laugh at them. Again, the methodology or the belief system that we follow based on the traditions of the Sahaba and those who followed them is that we believe in whatever Allah described himself with and whatever the Prophet ﷺ described Allah with without going into the interpretations or resembling or likening Allah to his creation. Allah will laugh in a manner which befits his majesty. How? We don't ask how. It's nothing that we can uh, understand in this worldly life. And Allah Azza wa will say, O people of paradise, where are those who used to obey me without having ever seen me? This is the day of increase. This is the day of ziyada. The ziyada is when Allah Azza wa will say to us, Where are those who used to obey me, but they had never seen me? Has anyone ever, anyone ever seen Allah Azza wa Jal? La tudrikul absar. No one can see Allah. Musa, alayhi salam, 
And you know the status of Musa among the prophets. He's from Ulul Azim of the Rusul. What did he say? Qala Rabbi Arini, Anzur ilayk. He said, Oh Allah, allow me to look at you. What did Allah say? Qala Lantarani, you will never be able to see me. No one has ever seen Allah in this worldly life. So Allah Azza wa Jal will reward those who believed in Him, like us. We ask Allah to make us among the righteous believers without ever having seen Him. This is the Iman. Iman is not that I tell you uh, who believes that this is a bottle of water and then everybody raises their hand and say, oh, I believe. Okay, well, hey, I mean, I have it right in front of you. Belief is when I say, you trust me for whatever reason. I hope you do trust me. If I tell you I have a bottle of water under the table, right? Your trust in me, wherein you say, I don't have to, I don't, he doesn't have to swear, and I'm telling you, I'm 100% sure he has a bottle of water. Why? I know he doesn't lie. For example, I have faith in this person that he's not a liar. Why would he tell me he has water when he doesn't? This is what makes you a believer. Because we believe in Al-Ghaib. All of the six pillars of Iman, don't worry, I'm not going to keep it under the table. All the six pillars of Iman are from Ghaib. Al-Imanu Billah. You haven't seen Allah. Wa Malaikati. Have you ever seen angels? Kutubihi, have you ever seen the previous scriptures or the Quran in the al Mahfuz? No, we only have the, the actual Quran in the book right now. But the scriptures of, of Ibrahim and Musa and Isa, we haven't seen. Have you seen the Rusul, including the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. Have you seen Yawm Al-Akhir, the last day? No. Have you seen Qadr, Khairi wa Sharri? You don't see Qadr. And we know it's in our lives, but we don't see it. All six pillars of Iman are believing in the unseen. So Allah Azza wa Jal will reward the people in Jannah accordingly. And of course, there are many hadith which reflect that. Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will speak to the believer and will say, did you not used to want such and such in this worldly life? And then the believer will say, yes, that Allah will give us things that we will forget. Meaning a person will be in such state of joy and bliss that he will forget the things he desired in the dunya. Allah will remind the believers of that. So the believers will see Allah's face subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. This is the biggest ultimate reward. The ahadith say, all of the pleasure which you may have, Hur al and the fruits and the rivers, all of that is in, they say, one part of the scale. And then looking at Allah's face is something that is totally unparalleled and, and un uncomparable to the rest of the pleasures. So my brothers and sisters in faith, how often do we think about that? Seriously, when was the last time one of us said to himself, I look forward to see in the face of Allah. I will leave alone the sin in order to be rewarded by Allah in Jannah. I will do such and such for the sake of Allah. Seldom. Subhanallah, we have become so preoccupied. And I'm speaking about myself. We have become so preoccupied that these meanings, these valuable meanings that the Prophet ﷺ instilled in the Sahaba have become absent in our lives. Why? Too much glamour now, which they didn't have back then. What did they have in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, in the desert? Nothing. What do we have today? Subhanallah. Beauties. A lot of things to look at. So we have become preoccupied. And the temptation is much higher. Therefore, the believers who come at this time will have the ajr of 50 among the Sahaba. Why? Holding on to the deen today is much more difficult than it was then. So this is an encouragement for myself and for you to uh, prioritize and reset our objectives and to make this Ramadan the beginning of a journey to enter Jannah, to be pr protected from the fire, to be admitted to Jannah. That doesn't happen for the one sleeping and it doesn't happen for the lazy and it doesn't happen for the one who doesn't do what Allah Azza wa Jal wants them to do. How can we summarize it? How does one attain it? Of course, there are many evidences from the Quran and Sunnah, but it's all summarized in obeying Allah and His Messenger. He said, He said, All of my ummah will enter Jannah except those who refuse. The Sahaba were shocked. The Messenger of Allah is inviting us to Jannah. Can you imagine one of us saying, I refuse. Would the Messenger of Allah invite one of us to Jannah and you say, I refuse? Is it possible? It's impossible. If you're a believer, it's impossible. 
So the Sahaba said, Who will, who will refuse the Messenger of Allah? He said, Man ata'ani dakhla al-jannah, wa man asani faqad aba. Whosoever obeys me will enter Jannah, and whosoever disobeys me has refused. So by rejecting the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the obligatory aspect of it, we're not saying every voluntary act of worship you have to do. Don't misunderstand. The Sunnah has obligations and voluntary acts. We're not referring to the voluntary, that's a bonus. But the obligatory aspects of the Sunnah, whoever rejects them or opposes the Messenger of Allah has technically refused to enter Jannah. So my brothers and sisters, why would we do this? We shouldn't. Let us bring this back to our lives. Every Salah, every Siyam, every Qiyam, every Sabaqa, every Amrun Bil Ma'roof, Wanahin Al Munkar, enjoining the good, forbidding the evil, we should always reflect and bring to mind this worldly life will come to an end and the ultimate success is in Jannah. I am doing this for the sake of Allah to be admitted to Jannah. And Allah Azza wa Jal, in Him we hope uh, that He will uh, grant us that and more based on what we assume of Allah Azza wa Jal that he loves his righteous slaves and we ask Allah to make us among the righteous slaves aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina muhammad jazakallah khair to uh, abu musab brother wajdi for his motivating talk we have some questions here uh, we we'll try to address the ones that are in somewhat connected to the topic um, the first question what is your opinion about near-death experiences? Many people from different religions and nationalities say they have experienced it and claim that they have entered a realm where there is unconditional love and where everything is heavenly. Is that only inside the brain or is it an illusion from shaitan? I mean, when it comes to these issues, we have to refer back to the Quran and the Sunnah. What I'm familiar with from the Quran are the ayat which indicate that there's no such thing. Then what does the ayah say? Until when death approaches one of them, he will say, Oh Allah, allow me to return so I may do good in that which I've left behind. And then it will be said, Kalla. And behind them there will be a partition. According to this ayah in the Quran, there is no way someone can go and come back. Because if someone were to go and come back, then there is no more belief in the unseen. And if there is no belief in the unseen, then there is absolutely no belief anymore. It, it, it goes against the very purpose of Iman. Therefore, whatever uh, statements of that sort are made are definitely from the shaitan. And we know that Allah Azza wa Jal allowed the shaitan to have certain authority against those who are distant from Allah. وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ نُقَيِّدْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينٌ Whosoever turns away from the remembrance of Allah, he will have a shaitan assigned to him so much so that he will be his close companion. So whatever they do to them of uh, illusional ideas and so on and so forth where they believe they went through a tunnel and they saw the light at the end of the tunnel and they went and saw paradise and then came back and they come and tell you, oh, by the way, such and such, no such thing. We know the Prophet ﷺ was admitted to paradise in his life and the Isra and Mi'raj and he got to see the castles of paradise and he saw the castle of Umar anhu and he saw even the Hur that were uh, uh, designated for Umar until he became... Uh, he lowered his gaze because he knew Umar would be jealous as you know in the hadith. So this is a, a miracle to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu As for the ordinary human beings, no one can claim that they have seen the life to come and then they're, they're back to life. It's, we just ask them what they ate before that near-death experience. It's probably some spicy food. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with spicy food. <laughs> it's like... Another question is, uh, the person is asking, one of, you know, one of the things that's, that can take people away from that path of aiming for Jannah, especially with the youth, is the, the topic of, or the problem of zina or fornication. So mm -hmm. what's your advice to those youth who are falling into this kind of, uh, this kind of problem? Nah. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, th there are things which enable someone to enter paradise 
and there are things which have to be left alone otherwise they will admit person to the hellfire not only that person will be deprived of jannah but they will be uh, you know entered and thrown into jahannam and among the major sins is the sin of zina and allah azza wa jal so much so that says wala taqrabu zina don't even come close what does that mean meaning all of the things which lead to zina which begin with chatting and begin with you know all kinds of uh, personal messages that are beyond the scope of what is acceptable in Islam all of these are the doors which lead to zina so look zina or fornication or adultery if you are not married it's uh, fornication if you are married it's called adultery in English but in Arabic it's all called zina is actually something that might be entertaining now but will bring a lot of agony in the life to come. How do we come over it? You give this simple example. If I have one dirham and I say to you, listen, I'll give you one dirham now or come back in two weeks and I'll give you 10 billion dirhams. Which one of you will take the one dirham now? Anyone? What if I'm a liar? Let's say I'm a liar. I lied to you, said I'm going to give you 10 billion dirhams in, in two weeks. Would you then take the dirham? No, most people say, maybe he's not a liar. Either way, keep your dirham. I will wait two weeks. If you're a liar, I'll get 10 billion dirhams. If you're not a liar, uh, then that's just great news. So this is how you would want to compare it. And of course, that's not even fair enough. Why would you take something that would bring temporary pleasure, but long lasting pain? The intelligent one is the one who says, I'll wait two weeks. And then you can do a lot of things with 10 billion dirhams. Same thing, you can have that relation outside of marriage now, but you'll be deprived of that in the life to come. In fact, you'll be burnt because of that in the life to come. What kind of intelligent decision is that? Very unintelligent. The smart person's one says, I'll leave it alone. I know it's a lot of fun or some fun, but this is not going to bring me any good in the long run. I will leave it alone for the sake of Allah. And then the part of the lecture which I didn't elaborate on, which is Hur al Ain, will make up for it. And for the sisters, you know, you'll be happy over there anyways. So just weigh them. Weigh them. Remember, this dunya in comparison to the life to come is like someone dipping their finger in an ocean and then picking it back up. All you see is a drop. This drop is the dunya versus the akhirah, the whole ocean. So. Make the right decisions and choices, inshallah. Inshallah, we'll take two more questions from here. Um, slightly off topic, but I think it's, uh, inshallah, important for someone on the path to Jannah. The person says, I want to quit my university and job and study Islam. They want to give up their job, leave uni drop out of university and study Islam. Please advise. Well, you cannot really advise uh, in such a general way because this may be suitable for one person and a disaster for another where are your parents I mean sometimes the youth uh, and I may look like one of the youth but that was a few years ago they get excited Allah is with fitna in the university and I'm, I'm going to Medina tomorrow and his mother's crying and his father's going you know berserk say wallah I made the decision ya akhi tawwal balak did you consult your parents hello the obedience to your mom and dad is an obligation you going to learn in any Islamic university is definitely not. Unless the whole ummah has invested their future in you, which will hardly apply to any one of us. So you cannot really advise anyone to say, Wallahi, that sounds good. We need more Muslim du'at and Muslim ulama and shuyukh. Therefore, yalla, bismillah. Quit the university and go. It doesn't work this way. It may apply for some. Maybe your parents will allow. They are uh, supporting, alhamdulillah. Maybe you're not doing so well in the worldly studies and you can excel in Islamic studies, alhamdulillah. You may not be able to be admitted to an Islamic university or you can learn. All of these things have to be taken in cons into consideration. So this may be a good thing for someone, uh, a horrible thing for another. Yes, the ummah can use more people that share the message of Islam in a professional uh, manner based on knowledge, absolutely. But that should not be done while ignoring other elements and factors that have to do with the success or lack of success in this, uh, you know, journey of yours. So depending on who you are, I suggest you first speak to your parents and then you consult a local imam or a local sheikh whom you trust who can speak to you and your parents. He can assess your 
situation. And then if, alhamdulillah, if Allah facilitates, then we encourage the parents to invest more among their children, those who will, you know, sacrifice their lives for the sake of Allah. Absolutely. But you could be the only one who brings, you know, who can get a job. You can be the only one who will take, it, take care of the family. You know, and that doesn't negate tawakkul, tawakkul on Allah, reliance upon Allah. You cannot leave the family suffering and begging so you can go learn while you yourself need money for your tuition. I mean, all of these things have to be taken in a very rational way. Yes, you're excited, alhamdulillah. But don't let the excitement make you make wrong decisions. Your family members, the, the people of knowledge around you will help you and guide you to know whether you are fit for this or not. Wallahu a'lam. Uh, the final question is, I mean, maybe you touched upon this, uh, but maybe they didn't get the, the grasp. Can we get things that we dream of in this world, uh, like luxury cars, etc.? Should, we, should we not aim for that and just say we'll keep it for Jannah? Well, I mean, if you drive the nicest car here, like I said, it's, it's not, you're not going to take it with you to Jannah and drive it over there. Uh, because whatever is in Jannah is ultimately better. Now you cannot really say also, this is another question that is somewhat tricky. If, if someone is so wealthy, you know, you cannot expect them to be riding a bicycle around when they can afford, you know, a luxurious car. So the scholars say the idea of israf and tabdhir, which is extravagance, is relevant to the person's budget. It's relevant to his income. It's relevant to his lifestyle. So for some, it is ex extremely normal. To be having three, four cars and three, four homes, this is the type of wealth they have. And no one can say that you should leave this alone completely. What the scholars say is, keep it in your hand, but don't let it go to your heart. That's it. If you're able to keep it in your hand where your heart is not attached, enjoy. Someone can be driving a fancy Mercedes, and for the qadr of Allah, something happens, and the next day he's driving X car, so no car will be insulted, and then he doesn't care. He's like, alhamdulillah, yesterday was a good day, today is a good day. He's patient, so it doesn't affect him. Another one, he will like one billionaire who was like ranked number 17th among the richest people. And then he did some bad transactions and he lost so much of his wealth that he went to the 35th ranking. He committed suicide. He was the 17th richest person. Lost some money, became the 35th. He said, what, what is this? So my life is, you know, I should bring it to an end. Yeah, you're still a millionaire. I mean, you're still a billionaire. You're still among the richest people in the world. This is someone whom wealth has gotten to their heart. So you can have it. You can drive them, but don't let it make it to your heart. Keep it in your hand. If it comes, it comes. If it doesn't come, alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Jazakallah khair to Brother Wajdi Akari for today's lecture. We'd like to remind you before you all leave that we have, as you come out of this hall on the right, there is a section called Kun Da'i. In there you'll have bags which contain dawa books to give many of you will have non-Muslim friends, non-Muslim colleagues, maybe even non-Muslim family. So please all do pass by afterwards. The back of the hall, you take a right and you can pick up a book. We have different languages, Malayalam, Tagalog, English, Hindi. Please uh, take the opportunity to pass on uh, some information to Islam to others who may not be Muslim. And we will actually have a prize draw as well. So please remain seated for the prize draw, inshallah.
في السكن الداخلي ولذلك قال ربنا ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا هل قال ربنا معها ولا تسكنوا إليها يا رمضان الندى والسلام تعال إليه